We are in this series called Unconditional, and as we talked about God's unconditional love, we look at how vitally important it is to every part of our life, and we're looking at how that agape love applies as God loves us, and then as we learn to love in different applications in our life. And this week, we're talking about friendship, and I'm talking about real friendship. Now, I looked on my Facebook page before I came, and there were 1,737 friends, all of whom I know intimately, I assure you. Uh, That's not really what a friend is. We have all kinds of acquaintances. We have some that are closer friends. And then you have some that are probably in the category best friends. I don't think best friend is a person. It's a category. And uh, I want to share with you a friendship that God has used, uh, one of the many ways in which he has encouraged and challenged me. And my friend's name is Joe Leininger. Some of you who've been here a long time may remember uh, when he came to Family Church. But we couldn't have been more different. Uh, he was raised in Chicago land, and I don't even really, I never even visited there except once. And I've been raised in little towns and little churches all my life. And uh, our wealth scale was very different. He was a commodities trader, and I wasn't even exactly sure if what they were selling. It wasn't commodes, I was pretty sure about that, but I didn't know if it was corn or what. But I didn't, I had to have him explain to me how a commodities trader worked. And he came out here to be a cattle rancher and came to family church. And uh, he'd come from a Catholic background. He was clearly a little more left-leaning politically than I was. So in every way, you wouldn't have thought that that was going to be a match. And yet, as he came to church and as we started going to breakfast together, God just knit our hearts together. And uh, I tell you, that friendship helped shape me, especially as a young leader. And one of the things that he brought was encouragement. Um, Here's a man who's written his own book, is very intellectual, a very spiritual man, and uh, and he would listen to a message, he would have some very helpful and very encouraging comments about what he was hearing God say in those, and and we had a lot of ways in which he affirmed my life and my calling. Um, He also challenged me. He asked me some hard questions and challenged some things we were doing, and like, why are you doing that, and why don't you think about this? Uh, one of the most specific ones that impacted me is, he said to me one day at breakfast, he said, Paul, I love what's going on here at Little Family Church. You know, you got something great going in a small community in a small area of the country. Um, God's really doing some great things here. But what I want to ask you is, what are you doing here that's going to impact the world? <laughs> and, and I gave an answer because I'm a pastor. You know, just say something. And... Uh, I walked away and thought, I don't think that's a very good answer. And God began using that to challenge me to say, how do we as individuals and as a church body, how do we make a difference around the world? And uh, in some of the ways that God has spread our influence to Cambodia and to beyond um, is partly because of that question that was just kind of stuck in my soul. And then there are many ways in which he just enriched my life. And, and, uh, And God took him on to a different place he didn't die. He, he, didn't, he just went to Colorado. And we've still kept in touch. When he's out this way, we go out to lunch or something. But there, were, there was a season that he was very active in my life. And that's over. But the value that he's added has, has lasted. And I want to say something to you that you may be surprised at as we talk about what friendship is. But I think, first of all, friendship is spiritual. That there's a way in which the people that we are connected to either feed and grow and challenge our spirit and draw us closer to Christ, or they have a tendency to pull us away and maybe just just entertain us, but not keep our focus on the Lord. And I want to tell you a story about one of the greatest friendships in the scripture. And we're going to go back into the Old Testament. And the first king of Israel's name was Saul. And he had a son named Jonathan. And Jonathan would have been the heir apparent. They were used to the king dies and the first oldest son takes over. And so that was Jonathan's role. And then in the story comes this shepherd boy from a little town of Bethlehem that's outside of Jerusalem. And, and he's the youngest of eight brothers and considered insignificant even by his brothers. And all of a sudden that story comes together in the story that probably is most famous in David's life, that is of him killing the giant. And When all of Israel was quailing before this nine-foot Goliath, David stands up and he says, how can he defy the armies of the living God? And then he goes out there and has this epic battle and he 
slings his slingshot and the, buries a stone in Goliath's head. And when he falls and dies, it galvanizes the troops of Israel and they press after the Philistines and they, they win the victory. And it's in that moment that we see this incredible fusion of the hearts of David and Jonathan. In 1 Samuel 18, it says this. If you don't know all the backstory, uh, be sure to read the devotions this week. We kind of walk you through some of the story. Uh, there's so much of David's life in the Old Testament that it's sometimes gets a little confusing. So it said, after David had finished talking with Saul, meaning after he had killed Goliath, after the battle is won, he comes and he has the conference with the king. It says, after that, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And from that day on, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. Don't you love that definition for friendship? That you become one in spirit. That there's this merging, not just of activities or of intellect, it's a merging of souls. And he talks about this in a powerful way because this is an unlikely friendship. Jonathan was the heir apparent. David, soon after this battle with Goliath, becomes the major threat because he's popular, because he is charismatic, and the, the women on the way home from this conversation sing that little song that Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his tens of thousands. And boy, that started the process of Saul seeing David as his primary rival, his primary enemy. And out of that, this is Jonathan saying, I see something different. I don't see a threat or a rival. I see a man that I admire. They were probably 10 years different in age. Jonathan would have been probably 28 to 30. David was under 18. He wasn't even in the army yet. Jonathan lived in the palace. He was the heir apparent to the whole of the kingdom. David was a shepherd that lived out in the fields and nobody knew anything about him. So there was, there was really no sense in which they would have just naturally connected, except I think what, David saw, or what Jonathan saw in David was a heart that was fierce for God, a heart that was filled with courage, a, a heart that was like Jonathan's. I, I can't tell you this, but I wonder if Jonathan didn't think, man, I wish I'd have been out there. Because that's the kind of spirit we, we later see in Jonathan. And he said, there's a guy that I want to make a friend of. I love his heart. I love his passion for Christ. I love his, his courage. I think we ought to be friends. And so he, he makes this approach to him. And then it goes on and it says, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. So he said, let's make an agreement. This is going to be a difficult friendship. Let's make an agreement. Let's make this covenant together. Make this agreement together to become friends. So first of all, friendship is spiritual, not only because of the impact it has on us, but because of the source. We talked last week about the fact that this agape love, which it talks about in the New Testament in the Greek, it's the word for unconditional love. It's the way when, when Jesus is asked, what are the two greatest commandments? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are both agape. So if that is the foundation of our relationships with each other, then it is certainly the foundation of relationship with our friends. And the step we talked about last week is it has to even start one step back from that, that I cannot give love that I have not received. The emphasis last week was agape love is the kind of way that God loves us that we don't have to perform, we don't have to have a certain moral standard, we don't have to have a certain level of spiritual activities. God just loves us. As we were talking about this in our life group, somebody said, you know, I never really got that till I had a child. She said, as I, as I held that baby, as that baby started growing up, I realized that I just loved that baby and they had done nothing for me. In fact, babies don't come along to enhance your life. And yet there's that little taste that we have of that agape love. So first of all, we receive love from God. And learning how to receive that is a critically important part of our spiritual journey. And then we have to learn to love God back. This may sound funny, but we have to agape God. That's the first commandment. Remember, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. 
And we struggle with that because God disappoints us. He doesn't do what we think he ought to. He doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we hoped he would. And because of that, some of us have a, a grudge against God, or at least we have a, a I don't, not sure I trust you. And so we learn to love God back. And think about this. If you can't love a perfect God, how are you going to love imperfect people? So really, this is kind of a sequence to learn how to receive love from God, to learn how to love God back. And then that begins to, to leak out into all of our relationships. That if I am receiving love and involved in a, in a love relationship with God, then it will leak out into every relationship of my life. In fact, it becomes God's display, God's love on display. He says, people will know that you're my disciples by how you love each other. And I would say that the friendships within the body of Christ are one of the greatest examples to the world that this is something that they need and want. And so it not only is a spiritual relationship because we are learning to channel God's love to each other, it's also a spiritual relationship because it has such an impact on us. And all the way through the book of Proverbs, he talks about this idea that you walk with the wise and you become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. And I want to ask you as we walk through this friendship, first of all, I think when we talk about good friends, our tendency is to say, man, I wish I had friends like that. Why can't my friends be better? And maybe you're sitting by one and you can elbow them. Um, let me ask you just to flip that. Can you say, I need to be a better friend instead of I wish I had better friends? That you need to be the kind of friend that is actually somebody who makes other people wise. You add value. You, <clears throat> you encourage. You challenge. You do, you do the same things that I was talking about when I talked about Joe. And so this idea that it's a spiritual impact, that our relationship with each other not only reflects our love for God, but it also either builds it or destroys it. And it's interesting that we tell our kids that. We can see it crystal clear when our kids start hanging out with somebody that's not that good for them. And uh, let me just tell you, it's the same with adults, that we need to have those friendships that are going to challenge and encourage us, but flip that script and say, am I a wise friend that helps my friends become wiser? Am I somebody that builds their spiritual life? And then the second thing I'd like you to put on your outline is friendship takes effort. It takes, first of all, initiation. Somebody has to start the friendship. Now, we wish they just happened sort of organically, like we just happen to be by somebody and we find a common interest. And, and, and that occasionally happens, but not all the time. In fact, the sad thing is too many lonely people in the midst of all kinds of people keep wishing for somebody to start a friendship with them. And if you are feeling lonely, and I think there's a lot of people that have struggled with loneliness through this last year. Let me, let me give you this challenge. Why don't you start a friendship? Why don't you initiate? You see, when, when Jonathan sees David, and when he sees his heart, he says, I want that guy to know that I care about him. And so here's what happens. Jonathan took off his robe that he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt. <laughs> I'm reading that and I'm thinking, what's he got left on? This sounds like he's given him everything. But think about this. He's the prince. He's wearing a fancy robe. David's a shepherd. He's just wearing whatever you wear out to the field. And then in this day, you might not even realize, but that the Philistines, they had the the monopoly on the ironworks. And so very few people had swords and many of them were inferior. And so he gives away his priceless sword. He gives his bow and his arrow. And basically he realizes that this is an initiation of friendship from the greater to the lesser. And he gives David the things that will bring him up close to his level. Obviously, it doesn't make him the heir apparent for the kingdom, but he gives him these incredibly valuable gifts. And I want to be the kind of person that is willing to take the risk to initiate. It's always scary when you kind of say, hey, can we get together? Can we go for breakfast? Uh, why don't you come fishing with me? It, it's initiate, initiating is risky, which is part of why we don't do it. But you know what? If God's love is overflowing out of us, then we will. I was thinking of one of our missionaries we have named Barbara. She used to be in the Philippines, but for the last 15, 20 years, she's been in Mexico. And uh, Barb, I love you, but your Spanish is terrible. 
And yet you have loved those people down there in, she lives in Chihuahua, Mexico. And she has just poured out her heart for her neighbors, for her friends. She went down there as a school teacher, and yet she started reaching out to the people who lived near her. And she created a backyard Bible club, and then she created a, a women's study. And you know, she's approaching the age when she should be retiring. And I think she may live the rest of her life there because those people that she reached out to in spite of the difference of culture and difference of, of language, she loved them because of God's love and now they have loved her back and she has this rich, deep community there. And I want you to ask yourself that question. Am I good at starting friendships? Let me, let me give you a couple of insights. It, over on the right side of your sheet, there's a little thing that just says, insights on friendship. And understand that I am not drawing this out of David and Jonathan's text. I'm just going to give you some things I've observed over the years that I think are so important. And so many people have difficulties making friends and keeping friends that I think this is really important. So first challenge I would give you is you become skilled at small talk, which leads to real talk. Small talk is just how you when you're, when you're talking to somebody that you don't know very well, you, you can talk about the weather, you can try to find a, some thread of commonality, something that they're interested in, that you're interested in. And it's a lot of work, and it's not really that rewarding in terms of, oh, this feels like a close friendship. But small talk is important because it leads to real talk. You have to start somewhere, and if you can start with maybe what seems like a, a shallow conversation, so we need skill at starting conversations, and we need skills at continuing conversations. And in that vein, let me give you, the, again, this challenge, and I say this a lot, ask good questions and listen more than you talk. <laughs> I say this a lot because I need this a lot. Um, learning to ask a question that draws somebody out and gives them an opportunity to share and, and try to find something that they're interested in when their face finally lights up and they go, oh yeah, I'm excited about this. Man, say, tell me more. And then listen carefully and well. And, you know, <laughs> some people don't know what to say and some people don't know when to quit saying it. So what I mean is that conversation is this delicate art. It's, it's like playing tennis. You know, some people come up and they just kind of tell you everything about their life and their stories and their emotions and they're just blopping all over you. And man, you do not feel encouraged or loved or cared about. And then some people may come up and just pepper you with questions and you feel like, I feel like I'm being interrogated. So, so think about it like this. A good conversation is like a good tennis match. Yeah, you may serve something, that's a very intentional question, but it's back and forth and back and forth. And if you're sitting there and somebody's just serving hard serves at you the whole time and you don't even know how to deal with all their questions, that's not a conversation. So ask yourself this, am I good at asking questions, at listening, at sharing some of myself? Am I good at that back and forth? Because it's that delicate relationship of conversation that builds a friendship. And then lastly, give the benefit of the doubt. Um, it is easy for us to get partway into a friendship and then to become sensitive, maybe overly sensitive, to, to because of the story in my own head, think that you said that because you're mad at me or because you think less of me or I heard something about you. Let me encourage you that good friendships need to survive the first difficulty. Um, there, that's why there's a commitment level that you need to think the best of your friend. You need to assume the best. And if there's a problem, you need to, to address it and talk it through. Clarify the problem so that you can maintain a friendship. Now, those are just a couple of quick pointers. There's a whole lot more. In fact, if you read through the book of Proverbs, it gives you a lot about our words and our friends and how we deal with that. So friendship takes somebody to initiate, somebody to start it, and then it takes commitment. And this commitment has to be from both sides. You can have a one-sided relationship for a while, but eventually it has to be a two-sided. So uh, this quote was given to us this week. It says, friends are given for a reason, a season, or a lifetime. Commitment doesn't mean that you will always be friends forever. Like my friend Joe, he is still my friend, but he was here in my life for a period of time, and it was rich and precious, and, and I value it. 
And there are times that people come and there are times that people go. And what you see in the, in the case of, covenant of, of David and Jonathan is that this was a mutual connection. It wasn't just Jonathan being a friend. David began to reciprocate that friendship with him. And uh, I think of how important that is. It makes me smile. If I think years ago there was somebody that came to our church and about the second week they were in our church, they came up to Jan and this fairly assertive lady said, after talking with her for like five minutes, you and I are going to be best friends, she told Jan. She said, I was best friends with my last pastor's wife and you're going to be my best friend. And my wife is a wonderful extroverter, but she is very introverted. And that to her was like this little voice in her head that said, run away, run away, run away. Because that just sounded scary and dangerous. And that, was, that wasn't initiating. That was like gang tackling, okay? So there's this delicacy of learning how to sense if this is a mutual friendship, if you're developing this connection together. In fact, I like this picture of not just a handshake, but they call it a rescue handshake. That if you're reaching over the cliff and you're trying to get somebody out, you don't trust your grip or their grip. You trust both of you together to pull that person up. And I think what a great picture that is. If you think back over your friendships that are really valuable, it's because both of you have chosen to say that's, that's valuable. It's not always one person calling or always one person inviting. It's a back and forth. And you have to, to reciprocate with what people are showing to you. And then a couple more clues from David and Jonathan's friendship. We're going to fast forward just a little bit, and David has definitely become a rival. Saul is now trying to kill him. In fact, has tried to kill him a number of times. And Jonathan finally comes to him, and he says, you know what? I know what God is going to do here. I want to read to you. This isn't on the overhead, but let me, let me read to you this that when Jonathan goes down to David, when he's hiding out from his father, and let me tell you, that's a complication in your friendship. If your friend's pop father is trying to kill you, it might create some difficulties. And so here's this great verse in chapter 23 of 1 Samuel. It said, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh, and he helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be the king in Israel and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord, and then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. What you see is this beautiful knitting together of hearts, and that Jonathan says, through no fault of my own, God's taking the kingdom, and he's taken it away from my father, and he's given it to you. But instead of me joining my father and wanting to, to kill you, I am going to join with you, and I'm going to say that you're going to be the king, and I'm going to be second to you. Can you imagine the humility that takes? The incredible love that that, that showed? And what, responds, what that does in David's life is he responds with an incredible commitment to Jonathan as well. Da Jonathan says this to him, but show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live. Remember we talked about that the love that we have for each other comes ultimately from God? And that's exactly what Jonathan's saying. The Lord's kindness is our model. Would you show me that kindness so that when you become king, I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. Jonathan again makes this incredible stark commitment and then David responds with, and Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of his love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. And so David makes the same kind of commitment that no matter what happens in the future and in the culture of the time when I become king and I am not the son of the one who was king, then I try to kill all his descendants to take away any chance of rivals. And here is Jonathan saying, I'm going to be second to you. I'm going to come under you. And God is going to make us a team in a way that neither of us saw coming, but we are committed to each other. And indeed, that's what happens. Saul is killed, and unfortunately in that story, Jonathan is also killed. And David goes on through a long and arduous process to become king of Israel. And so he's lost his friend Jonathan. He's lost his enemy, Saul. And about 15 years later, 
David is securely in his kingdom. Saul's gone out of the picture. He's dead, but his whole family is out of the picture. And, and David remembers one day his friendship with Jonathan. And he says, is there anybody that's still living from Jonathan's household so that I can show kindness to him? And there was an immediate response. They said, yeah, there's a guy. His name is Mephibosheth. <laughs> Try to say that. Mephibosheth. Uh, don't worry, half the people on staff can't say it either. This is a inc- cool story that maybe you're not familiar with. Here's David secure in his kingdom, and he says, I remember my friend Jonathan. We made a commitment to each other and to each other's children. And is there anybody I can show that kindness to? And so they tell him the story of Mephibosheth, that when Saul and Jonathan were killed, Mephibosheth was five years old. And his nurse, fearing what would happen, picks him up to run and to take him out, and she drops him. And because of that, he's crippled in both of his feet. And and where we see Mephibosheth right now, he is in a foreign country. He is over in Gilead. He's hiding out in a place called Lodabar, which means the edge of nothingness. His dad is gone. His grandpa's gone. All his hopes of a royal family are gone. He's got nothing. And David calls him and he said, would you go get Mephibosheth? Would you bring him here? And here's this scenario when he comes to see David. It says, when Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, and at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. You talk about a picture of grace. Mephibosheth, he didn't owe him anything. He was a son or the grandson of a rival. He was out of the country. He was unable to take care of himself. He was crippled in both feet. And David said, you know what? I'm going to give you all the land that your grandfather had. (laughs) My enemy, your grandfather. And I'm I'm going to bring you into my table like one of the royal sons. And that's how Mephibosheth spends the rest of his life. And what a powerful picture it is that that God knits their heart together, partly because of of not their similarities, but of they have a common heart for God. And that Jonathan helps David find strength in God when David is discouraged. Isn't that a great, great definition of a friend? I help you find strength in the Lord your God. And that Jonathan initiates, David responds, Jonathan is killed and David comes along and years later takes care of his son. And I hope that as we walk through this, that God challenges your heart, not only with maybe remembering some of the valuable friendships that God has poured his love into your life through them, but that you might make a a commitment and say, I want to be more of that kind of friend. I want that to describe me. Well, we're so glad you've joined us, and I, uh, I really hope as you've, if you listened to last week, I hope that God really has been working on your heart about how much he loves us and how much that love is supposed to flow out of our life. And so that again, we come back to the same question we had last week, choose to actively believe that God loves me. Choose to say, I, I am going to live like that is true, like God not just loves people, not just loves a few, but that he loves me individually. And, and see if that doesn't make a difference in your life. And then as we've talked about the friendship this week, I want you to think through the friendships in your life. And I want you to, to ask God, which one do you want me to invest in? And, and by that, I mean three things. Um, this has been an incredibly tough year, and there's been a lot of losses. And unfortunately, some of those losses have been friendships. Um, you've come down on different sides of one of the is- many issues that are involved um, you just have lost touch because the isolation from the, the COVID restrictions and you just don't see each other as much. And, and maybe, maybe you need to apologize to somebody and invest in a relationship that way. Maybe you just need to call them up and spend some time with them because, because it, you just have kind of lost connection. And, and maybe some of you, were, as I was walking through that, you were deeply reminded of some people that have poured into you. And maybe you just need to write them a note or, or make a phone call and to say, 
man, you've made such an addition to my life. I am so glad God put you into my life. Whatever you do, if you say, God, how do you want me to show your love in the friendships in my life? And you can repair, reconnect, or maybe just appreciate somebody that's been a friend. Thanks for joining us. I hope this makes an impact on your life. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for the incredible statement that you call us your friends, that we are receiving your love and learning to love you, and we're not good at it at all. But the better we learn to love you, the better we learn to love each other. And so I pray that you'd put on our hearts how much you love us and you'd make it real to us. And that you would also help us, Lord, when we think about our friends, that if there's somebody we need to apologize to, that we'd have courage to do that. If there's somebody we'd just have kind of let that friendship slip and, and we need to reinvest, maybe there's somebody that we just need to appreciate and say, man, I don't know where I'd be without you. So thank you, God, for the friendships that you've given me. Thank you for the friendships that you've given each of us. And help us not to worry about finding a better friend, but about being a better friend. In Jesus' name, amen.